I hope that throughout this weekend, you revel in the sense of accomplishment that is rightfully yours. And the stories, the amazing stories. We realize that every single cap and gown contains another story. And your parents, your siblings, your friends will hear and can tell us those stories as well. Great sense of accomplishment. But before you leave Loma Linda University, before you receive that sheepskin tomorrow, you've got to, ask a, you've got to answer no, another couple of questions that I want to ask you this morning. You can't be Loma Linda graduates without answering these questions. Fair enough? I want to talk to you from the book of Proverbs, and I want to talk to you about words. So both of these questions have to do with words. Don't answer them immediately. Think about them. Here's the first question. How do you spell potato? <laughs> How do you spell potato? As my daughter would say, well, that's random. Well, maybe not quite as random because 31 years ago, almost to the day, June 15, 1992, Vice President of the United States, Dan Quayle, visited a Trenton, New Jersey middle school. And while at that middle school, he called a young man named William Figueroa to the board and asked him to spell potato. And he spelled it out, P-O-T-A-T-O. -T -O. Mission accomplished, right? Right? Except that the president, vice president said, well, now, wait, 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 wait just a minute. Add a little bit there at the end. Figueroa was a bit befuddled for a moment. And the VP said, just put an E on the end. And so he did. I mean, it's the vice president, right? P-O-T-A-T-O-E. How do you spell potato? Now, that was a great puzzle to me because when I started elementary school, I started the first little piece of time being homeschooled by my mom. But my younger sister was born, so I was shipped off to school. We were living in a Spanish-speaking country at the time, and so I essentially learned to read and write Spanish before English. When some years later I started attending an English school, it was the most befuddling experience I can remember having. What do you mean, though, is T-H-O-U-G? How do you get though out of that? Because Spanish sounds like it spells and spells like it looks. And then how can you have through, the man walk through the door, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, and the boy through the ball, T-H-R-E-W? Neither one of them is right. And how can, I don't understand this language. How do you spell potato? E or no E? Well, I want to help you a little bit this morning in this befuddling language. The correct way to spell potato. You ready for this? You're going to need this. You're Loma Linda grads. <laughs> so here we go. G-H can be pronounced P. You'll see it on the screen as in hiccup. And O-U-G-H can stand for O, as in do. And P-H-T-H can sound like T, as in tasis. And E-I-G-H sounds like A, as in neighbor. And T-T-E can stand for T, as in gazette. And finally, E-A-U is pronounced O, as in plateau. <laughs> and so obviously... The right way to spell potato is, there it is. Anybody knows by looking at that 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 says potato. Forget about the E. Know how to spell it right. That's the first question. We're good? All right, we're set. Second question, also about a word. What is the meaning of the word paraprosdokian? Paraprosdokian. You spent quite a bit of time on this in class, right? Right? 
All right, so a quiz. This one is multiple choice. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, although I should. Maybe we should ask them to raise their hands. What do you think? <laughs> but I want you to keep in mind what your answer is. Okay, multiple choice. Four multiple choice. A paraprosdokian is A, a story where two protagonists are on a parallel pathways without knowing it. B, a telling of history where one side is left out. C, a scientific theory where two hypotheses are exactly the same except for one major detail. And D, none of the above. All right, now I am going to ask you to vote. But I'm going to include your family, right? Because they're, you know, family members of Loma Linda graduates. So who chooses A? Let me see your hands. A, a few, not that many. B, let me see your hands. Oh, man, B is missing out. C, let me see your hands. Okay, we've got a few more than that. D, let me see your... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. Here is the dictionary definition of paraprosdokian. Here it is. Paraprosdokian is a sentence or expression in which the second part provides an unexpected resolution or contrast to the first part. So D was the right answer. There you go. An unexpected contrast with the remainder of the statement. So here are a few examples of paraprosdokians. Light travels faster than sound. That's why some people appear bright until you hear them speak. <laughs> Another one. The early bird gets the, roam, but, gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. <laughs> To steal ideas from one person is plagiarism. To steal from many people is research. <laughs> uh, please don't tell people that behind me that I said that. A bus station is where the bus stops. A train station is where the train stops. On my desk, I have a workstation. <laughs> Or why is it that one careless mask can start a fire, but it takes a whole box to start a campfire? Why do many believe you when you say there are over four billion stars, but check when you say that pain is wet? <laughs> Don't touch it. Or what about this one? You actually do not need a parachute to skydive. You only need a parachute if you want to skydive again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to be indecisive but now I'm not sure. <laughs> and finally, the paraprosdokian that really matters to you today. As graduates, the only thing that now stands between you and the top of the ladder is the ladder. <laughs> That's all. Just the ladder. And there are many expectations that people have of you now that you're about to start climbing that ladder. If you think I'm just saying that, here are some names much more wise than mine. Michelle Obama, the graduates of today want to change the world, and they are equipped with the tools and knowledge to do so. Bill Clinton, the world needs graduates who are willing to take risks, think creatively, and work tirelessly to make a difference. Nelson Mandela, graduates have a responsibility to use their education to make a positive impact on society and change the world for the better. Melinda Gates, the world needs graduates who are not just intelligent, but also compassionate, empathetic, and committed to making a difference in the lives of others. And finally, Malala Yousafzai, the graduates of today are not content with just getting a degree. They want to use their education to make a difference in the world. Do you know Malala? You know her, the 12-year-old, Lorena the 12-year-old young girl who was shot because of her commitment to education for women and girls. But a bullet piercing her skin did not stop her. She kept fighting. She continues her fight today so that she became the youngest Nobel Prize winner of all time. And she continues to work to change the world. Bottom line, all that stands between you and the top of the ladder is the ladder. And you got to start climbing that ladder. And there are now, sorry to tell you, expectations on you. But I'm going to leave it to those wiser than I.
to talk about some of what happens on that ladder as you climb. What I want to talk about, rather than reaching the top of the ladder, is what happens on the climb. The struggles for power, the fights over who's in control, the damage created between human beings when anger runs amok. And to do that, I want to take you to Proverbs. I've actually fallen in love with this book all over again, reading through it again this year. One or two Proverbs at a time. It's timeless and timely wisdom. Now, listen carefully. Don't blink. You'll miss it. It's one verse long. Just to be sure we capture the essence of what it is, I'm going to read it three times in three different versions, translations. One, the New International. Two, the New Living. And three, the paraphrase called The Message. So here it is, Proverbs 25, 15. It says this, Through patience a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. New Living Translation. Patience can persuade a prince, and soft speech can break bones. And then finally, the message. Patient persistence pierces through indifference. Gentle speech breaks down rigid defenses. Now, what jumps off the page right away in whatever version you read it is that the wise man is speaking to his listener, to his reader, assuming that the reader is wanting to change something or someone, change something or someone who's actually more powerful than they are. The NIV translates it a ruler. You want to change a ruler? In other words, you want to speak truth to power? You want to make a difference in the world? You want to learn how to deal with those who are fighting for your rung on the ladder? Here, says the wise man, is what you would do well to remember. I don't know. Gentle persuasion? Patient persistence? Seriously? I think the way you change the world is you become a social influencer. Use social media to your benefit. Get a large following. Tweet out stuff that will rile them up and keep them coming back. That will change the world. Or Make sure you choose the right cause and the right people to stand beside you as you stand beside them. Fight together. You can accomplish much in that fashion. Or strategize. Think through carefully. Here's where I am. There's where I want to be. What's the way to get there? Graduates, every one of those has some good things to commend it, right? Any one of those can work, can help. And the wise man says, patient, persistence, gentle words. What is this about gentle words and broken bones? It's an image, it's a metaphor from another day and time, so the brief comments of two Old Testament scholars would be helpful. The first one from Raymond Van Leeuwen, he says this, in this delightful oxymoron, the softest organ, the tongue, breaks the hardest organ, the bone. It's similar to the English expression, the pen is mightier than the sword. That brains are better than brawn is a recurrent theme in Proverbs. Whoa. It's not all about whether or not you have the power. The strength. The wise man has been saying, use this organ more than this one. Second Old Testament scholar, Bruce Walkie, 
This language may have been chosen because the bones are the most rigid body parts inside of a person, and the fracturing of the bones here refers to breaking down the deepest, most hardened resistance to an idea a person may possess. Don't misunderstand. Just because the tongue is softer than the bone, don't read that to say weaker. The wise man is not talking about weakness. He's talking, yes, about patient persistence, about gentle words, but he's talking about words that are true and strong and weighty and big and that refuse to give up. Now, unless I miss my guess, somebody here, one of you graduates, one of you family members, it's saying, come on, come on. What, what, what are you talking about? Anger is the order of the day. Now is the time to yell louder, shout more, to be noticed. Why this proverb? Well, let's be clear, and the wise man would agree with this. There are times when anger is morally required. To not be angry at certain realities is to either be apathetic or fearful. Don't misunderstand that. But if we only have anger, well, it becomes the person who only has the one tool, the hammer, in her or his toolbox, and you just can't get everything done with a hammer. And so here the wise man says, patient, persistence, gentle words. In fact, have you noticed? Have you noticed how sometimes when you get angry and you speak your mind, you walk away feeling really good? I told them, told them exactly what they needed to hear. Nobody else would dare to speak it. I told them. Whenever I get to feeling that way, I think of a pastor preaching from this pulpit, probably 33, 34 years ago, sitting here and listening to him say, Clarence Schilt was his name, listening to him say, we do most of our sinning when we're right. We do most of our sinning when we're right. So then Jacob Needham, Needham wouldn't leave that alone, and he added one more piece to it. These are Needham's words. Think about it. The person who is brutally honest enjoys the brutality quite as much as the honesty, possibly more. You relate to that? A sense of righteous indignation. It's curious how when I feel it, it's righteous indignation. When you feel it, you're just ticked off. And the wise man says, Patient, persistence, because gentle words can often accomplish what harsh words cannot. Not weakness. No, 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 no. Strength, strong enough to be patient and persistent and controlled. So does that work? Can that change the world. It's almost 20 years ago. In the Ukraine, it's time for the elections. Viktor Yushchenko, the rival candidate, was certainly going to win, was he not? The people against their government had risen up in support of Yushchenko. Surely he was going to win. This was the day, and yet there were questions as to whether or not the government would allow it to be. The writer Philip Yancey writes about that event and that day with these words. Yancey says, that evening the state-run television reported, ladies and gentlemen, we announced that the challenger Viktor Yushchenko has been decisively defeated. However, government authorities had not taken into account one feature of Ukrainian television. The translation it provides for the hearing impaired. On a small screen insert in the lower right-hand corner of the television screen, a brave woman raised by deaf-mute parents gave a different message in sign language. 
I'm addressing all the deaf citizens of Ukraine. Don't believe what they say. <laughs> They're lying. And I'm ashamed to translate these lies. Yushchenko is our president. Gentle, persistent, truth. No one in the studio understood her radical sign language message. But people who could not hear watched. And they understood. And they began what became known as the Orange Revolution. Listen to Yancey again. They text messaged their friends about the fraudulent elections, and soon other journalists took courage and likewise refused to broadcast the party line. Over the next few weeks, as many as a million people wearing orange flooded into the capital city of Kiev to demand new elections. The government finally buckled under the pressure, consenting to new elections, and this time, Yushchenko emerged as the undisputed winner just silent truth. Yancey concludes, our society is hardly unique. Like the sign language translator in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, along comes a person named Jesus who says, in effect, don't believe the big screen. They're lying to you. It's the poor who are blessed, not the rich. Mourners are blessed too, as well as those who hunger and thirst and the persecuted. Those who go through life thinking they're on top will end up on the bottom. And those who go through life feeling like they're at the very bottom will end up on top. After all, what does it perf profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their own soul? That's the truth. From the lips of an itinerant Nazarene rabbi, who said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Don't read that as weakness. It is the strongest reality to speak truth to power. And in a world where everyone is shouting, a whisper is compelling. Just down in the right corner of the screen, telling the truth. So you say, but I'm just a graduate, just a Loma Linda graduate. Sure, I know how to spell potato. I know what paraprosdokian is. But what difference can that make in the world? Sometimes your words can change the world, at least for somebody. I wanted to show you a video today. Try as we might, we couldn't secure permission to show it, so I'm going to share it. It's a video called Simply the Power of Words on YouTube. It's a gentleman, a man who has lost his vision. He's blind. He comes at, in the public square and sits down on a big, broad sidewalk, sits down and gets comfortable, puts his tin can for donations there, and props up his sign, I'm blind, please help. And the day begins. And the rushing workers go hither and yon, to and fro, hardly a one pausing, occasionally a chink in the can, and he says, thank you. And then you can hear it. A young businesswoman, dressed for work, comes with her heels clicking and clacking on the sidewalk, comes rushing by, but then they stop and turn around and come back, and she stands right in front of him. Blind man, a bit bewildered at first, realizes someone is standing there. She has reached down, and she has taken his sign, and she's turned it around and taken his marker and begun to write on the sign. He, obviously curious, feels of her shoes, trying to get a sense, trying to see who this is. She finishes writing, sets it back down, and leaves. But after she is gone, 
We hear more clinks in the can and more and more. And pretty soon, they're not only landing in the can, but all around him. Everybody is giving. He has no explanation, but suddenly his day, his world has changed. And then at the end of the day, you hear the clickety-clack of the high heels on the sidewalk approach again and stop in front of him. He once again feels these are the shoes. And he says, what did you write on my sign? And she says, I just told the truth. This is now what his sign says. It's a beautiful day, and I can't see it. And it changed his world. You have that power. Every one of us does. You have the ability to do exactly what the wise man says here, to speak truth to power. In a world where everybody screams, a whisper is compelling. So take courage. Have a strong heart, a ramrod spine. Go out and with every beautiful, gentle, Strong, truthful word you speak. Change the world. Mm -hmm.